Atheist Nomads, episode 139. Interview with Mikey Pullman. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. Joining us in studio is my lovely wife, Lauren. I'm here. And on the new interface brought to us by our listeners, we have Mikey Pullman in studio. Hi! (laughs) That's so ridiculous. I'm never doing that again. You should. (laughs) Yeah, nope, doing it. Was that Krusty the Clown impression? (laughs) No, I can't do impressions. I've tried. Okay. I just, uh, uh, yes. Mikey is a, a local here in Boise. He's a stand-up comedian. He has actually won Boise's best comic on at least one occasion. Just the one. Yeah. I was never even, I was in the running the year before, but I failed. You've also mentored some people that have won, right? I've just, it's, comedy relationships are complicated. Okay. <laughs> it really is just, <laughs> it's Facebook a subset. Tech, it's complicated. It's, <laughs> right. It's really, it's a subset of the internet users that read the Boise Weekly, because all the voting's online, and it's just the Boise Weekly voters which is a subset of the Boise greater metropolitan area, is what it is. And out of those people, I think I got more of the gays this time. It's like like any voting Mm. block, just because I'm openly bisexual. Uh, I've got some of my social media fans because I really, really begged them to vote for me. Right, right. And then there were other, gr- there were other it gets groups. gets far, you know. I, I Begging you. gets too far. It's, I, I ran it like it was a campaign, and I've never done that before. I just I contacted people, and I was like, you vote for me, please. They're like, sure. <laughs> it's like, are you canvassing your friends and family? Yeah. That's really uh, it's, interesting. It's a dumb credit. I mean, not, no disrespect to the Boise Weekly. I really, I think it's a fine magazine. It actually looks really good on your resume. Yeah, it looks, no, it really does. <laughs> I drop it, I like to drop it during interviews with like the manager. I was like, and <laughs> about me. So that was, a, yeah, that was a fun thing. I don't plan on working that hard for it this time because you kind of have to act like you're too cool for it. Because the minute you get it, you have to be like, it's not really, it doesn't mean anything. And here's the thing, it doesn't mean anything. But I have to say that, so it's weird. Like, and I really do feel that way, but there's no way to tell the difference. Because if you don't act humble when you win stuff, people think you're a dick. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Well, you're a comedian, though. You're allowed to be the dick. Well, what I'm doing right now is I'm talking about it. That's what comedians get to do. Yeah, yeah. But everyone else just does that. And then they (laughs) act like that's normal. And I'm the one that's like, this is stupid. (laughs) Yeah, because yeah. like, it is dumb. <laughs> Why can't you be like, I'm a thing, yay? When everyone else is like, because here's the deal: if I went to New York with that shit, they'd be like, where the fuck is Boise? I mean, if you, if you win the L.A. comedy competition, they'll be like, oh yeah, but that was last year. Oh. So, it doesn't doesn't matter. <laughs> or they'd say, where's Boise? Oh. Yeah, even if you get the Tonight Show, they'll be like, you weren't as good as the last guy. So there's just no winning. It's entertainment yeah. is just you got to have thick skin and you just got to plow through. Well, in my understanding with the whole comedy scene is if you really want to do well, you start out in a place like Boise, get to the top there, and then you have to move to a place like Portland or Seattle, get to the top there, and then you have to go to either L.A. or New York. That's it's just e- lots of touring. <laughs> <laughs> it, but here's the thing, guys. Uh, that's not where the millionaires in comedy are being made now. Mm. All your millionaires in comedy are not what you would think of traditionally as comics. Social progressionists move past that. It's YouTube millionaires. Oh. People that I literally, or people even who do start doing stuff like this, you know, there are a lot of comics who are just road comics until their bl- their blog or their uh, podcast got 25,000 followers. And the next thing you know, you're being invited on a funny show and you did that on your own. Uh, Patton Oswalt was actually speaking before a uh, conglomerate of entertainment m- m- owners and stuff. And he basically told them, look, this is the age of your entertainment wing not having to beg to get in. We can make our own stuff. We could reach our own thing. So that was my thing in Boise. What I probably Hmm. will do is move to a larger city and then do the same format there. Become popular in the city, doing things there, getting involved. Everything I've done here from the social activism to like, I'm the one that puts together the atheist shows every year. And and it's fun. Four so far, right? Yeah, four. I don't know. I keep calling them annual, but they're not even close to being a they year apart from each other. They were annual, and then we're like, nah, let's just do it in January. Yeah, next one's in June, but I'm kind of... I don't want to say I'm over it, but 
Creative types have a tendency to do things four or five times, and instead of making it successful, they just stop doing it. They're like, it. okay, <laughs> just, we had a good run. Yeah, yes. so in, in my role as, as uh, executive director of TV Core, one of the things I, I've Name had to drop. look at recently mm-hmm. was... Right. <laughs> good work. Where are we... Where are we now as a, a larger atheist community, and where do we need to go? And what I've noticed is nobody gives a shit. <laughs> that's we, true. We yeah, got, that's pretty general, though, across the board. Right. We got yeah. the capital steps last year yeah. for, for uh, National Day of Prayer, and nobody was bothered. They were actually, I think, okay with going inside. And it was raining, but nobody, nobody cared. We marched in the 4th of July parade, and we get fewer and fewer boos every year. <laughs> uh, you continue to sell out liquid laughs. It's almost all 100% atheists. Yeah. And that is a, that's the comedy club downtown. I don't know what the numbers are, but we've had over 100 people in there. And it's not, not packed, packed. Like, I don't need to open up all the green room and fill people, but that's right close to where we're at. Mm-hmm. Now. And nice. you always you get a few hands raised when you ask if there's any Christians out there, and, you, yeah. and they always get stared at. Like well, I get to do a nature. speech now. I learned this after a couple years that I, I let someone know when I'm hosting that, look, this isn't anti you. This is just the one time we have to do a show that's definitely about mm-hmm. us. Yeah. So please don't be offended. If you have questions, find someone, you know, or talk to me. I'll be cool about it. I mean, I'll be drunk after the show, but they can. <laughs> <laughs> I, and that's Apparently my problem. Apparently blackout. I get too drunk at those shows. I need to scale that back. Yeah, in, we, my next we're not, one. we felt kind of bad about buying you a drink after. You <laughs> I don't remember any of that. Nope. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were, you were funny. Yeah, it's dumb, though, because I paid to record that show to use it for submission videos, and it is not usable. Yeah. Like, it's so... Your tangents were a little off. <laughs> yeah, but... it wasn't as dialed in. Oh, well, but it was funny. Thanks. <laughs> well, I do this 85% improvisational stand-up now, which is actually something Rory Scovel I really was inspired by. And you go in with bits, yeah, but you do mostly improvisational tie-ins and, and callbacks and everything, and it's a combination of improv and stand-up. I think it's it's more engaging than traditional stand up, which you can mm-hmm. stream or you could watch on YouTube or Netflix. You can only see my shows are always different. I might have some of the same jokes, but I'm never going to give you the same show, even if nice. I start in or in the same. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I do a thing, but that's stylistic. I feel like I'm in the dojo in Boise studying my Kung Fu and trying to perfect it as opposed to going out and proving myself as a champion. And if and I notice when I end up street. in a and it works, though, and I'm in a good situation, I always do well. And I'm also learning how to do things when it's bad. But that's just kind of the thing about how stand-up is and why you go on the road is because you then get to fail in Nebraska and nobody gives a shit. Or <laughs> Idaho. Nobody cares You can about eat Nebraska. shit in Idaho and no one will remember but us and we don't yeah. care. Yeah, so with the, the Atheist Comedy Show, maybe, yeah. and I, I have the same feeling for TV Core, is that downtown Boise is, doesn't care if people are atheists anymore. No, it's they not really edgy. don't. A lot of young people, and they don't really care. So it's time you, to take you go all 20 of that. miles out of the city, though. Yes. Oh yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm it's not doing that. To take all that to <laughs> Mountain Home and Nampa. Mountain Home has a popular comedy show that gets put on monthly. I don't know. I mean, Elmore County voted for Trump and the primary, so I don't know if we're ready <laughs> to go that direction. But that's yet. the point, right? Is to well, get out there and stir. We're bored. We're bored <laughs> in Boise. Um, we want to kind of rile people up, and the next place we can think of is usually Nampa, because the previous mayor of Nampa was so. Well, they this have, is a Christian city. They have a big parade and festival every year in Nampa. It's the gods God and, and guns country. or something. It's God and right. country. God and yeah, country. Right. How many banjos do they have? Uh, I think there's more <laughs> no, guns I, than about, banjos, but they have many. about as many banjos as they have teeth. They, they have, they're more into the youth, youth rock. Yeah, I yeah. should be into that. DC Tuck, yeah. Newsboys, if Audio get, Adrenaline. If you want to get banjos in Idaho, you go to Yellow Pine. Yeah. I, you know, here's the thing. I go on the road occasionally through the Northwest, Montana, Idaho, North Idaho, and I out myself as an atheist every single time at a point during the show after they already think I'm funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, because that point, they already think of me as a person. Yeah. And I find that yeah. I, it's a, a good time for it. And then I use that to. Still, I still admit my humanity, but that way, if I talk about God, it's like, yeah, you know, I mean, because here's the thing. I genuinely do think that most religious people are good people. Sure. Uh, and so it makes it easy when I meet them then to not think they're horrible and they're going to hate me. They might have opinions, but fuck it. I leave town after the show. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel that exposure is one of the things that I feel like we do have and why I 
feel a responsibility to out myself when I go out after totally. people like me. Do you do the same thing yeah. with your sexuality? Well, yeah. Because Mikey, how a long are your sexual sets? male is. Um, currently Sorry. sets, I, most of the time I, I work in the 25 to 30 minute range. Okay, you got some time to like warm them up and then flip yeah. them a little bit and then... Yeah, but I believe like I'm doing a headlining set uh, downtown uh, at the Olympia this May. Date to be determined. And Uh, is uh, (laughs) is that Olympia, Washington? It's Olympia is the bar, I believe. It's whatever they're calling it. It's above Mulligans. Downtown Boise. Yeah, downtown Boise. And uh, I'm headlining that set, so I'll be doing 45 minutes to an hour. Wow. And, and then it'll come up, but it'll end up just being one of the many conversations that I'll have with the audience. Because sure. that when that's you're having your an hour, oh yes, I was just saying that's kind of your style. Yeah, uh, yeah, Sorry. yeah. I do. I will just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> As you've noticed, As sure. everyone notices, I uh, yeah. So yeah, it's it's fun. And it's, of course, it's a fun subject for me. I like the atheist thing because uh, target marketing is actually just smart marketing, and the atheists have always been good to me. And I've always been. I was one of the first one or two hundred people in the Idaho atheist group. <laughs> that we we had him on Facebook, and like I remember joking about baking cookies for people as they came in, yeah. <laughs> and like that was a long time ago. So it's nice that there's more people around, even though it's gotten complicated and occasionally more dramatic. I, the increase of numbers, I think, is worth the price to have racists and uh, gun fetishists among us because they will also maybe have good ideas, and that's how I think it should work. Yeah. Even though most of their ideas have been dumb so far. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've run a few people out of the group, unfortunately. That's um, just social systems, right? But that is kind of how that works. Uh, but as for, I mean, when it, the, the show that you do brings out more atheists that I have never met than any other group or meeting or anything that I've ever like been a part of. I, I was surprised, honestly. The first year went well, and it's been better ever since. And every year there's more people and there's all these people. I'm like, how come I never see you at anything? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, because these people are just people and they, they want to like, laugh, but they don't necessarily want to do activism. Right. And, they don't want to be a part of anything. They just want someone yeah. who gets it. Mm-hmm. I think I think you're smart on that one. I think yeah. that's smart. Mm. So we need to like target more for that, I think. Just just fun. But let's make fun of religion in the, in the process. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah sometimes. Because <laughs> there's, there's two ways to go when... Being an atheist is no longer edgy. You either move to where it still is, or you actually the try Jim to- Jeffries approach. That yeah. yeah, I'm not I'm not that abrasive anymore. Or well, Jim you- Jeffries and uh, Eddie Ift actually had a podcast for a long time called Jim and Eddie Talk Shit, which uh, really <laughs> raised their profile for both of them. And the, it was actually a pretty damn funny show. The other thing you do is you try to leverage on the acceptance, and that's kind of what I, I the direction I. I, I kind of hope we can go manage to pull off going both directions, mm-hmm. both spread out into the larger uh, region and capitalize. Although the problem is the uh, state legislature right now is too far to the right. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think we can really get that until we have a shift in uh, just the population. Yeah. And we're going to get that over time. And, you know, when the state has three million people, it'll, it might be vastly different. Yeah. We might not be here. <laughs> yeah. But Hopefully at some point, <laughs> yeah, people will need to move away from the coast. It's already prohibitive to live. It's hard to live in Boise. And it's so it's like San Francisco. No one can live there anymore. You can't really live in Seattle. Uh, I, there are New York comics I'm friends with on Facebook and Twitter that joke about being proud to be the last generation of comics who can live in New York City. Like, mm-hmm. and that's not joking. That's like already headliner comics I know who are incredibly hilarious, funny. We'll have to share bedrooms with three or four other people in New York just to live there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, no. And screw that. That's not sustainable. Not for, and that's just if you're you. Never mind if you had, you know, anything that you owned or a person you took with you places. Yeah, and, and never mind that the uh, ocean is rising and they're losing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, ca- I'm kind of surprised that like comedy shops don't have their own little tenement building and just rent them out cheap to comics <laughs> and have their own little. Oh God, it'd be constant fighting. Yes, we're fires. pretty dramatic. Like all, like all. Uh, any any group of creative people who expresses themselves through words fights more than any group I've known. That's actors, poets, Flipping storytelling. Tables. Recently, story story for it got pulled out oh. of uh, out of Tree Fort, our music festival, because of the drama between the founder of it and her co-founder who was sitting in the front row. These are all wow. friends of mine, 
and they got kicked out of the whole thing because one <laughs> of them told a story about the other one's sexual assault and used first names. Oh, Holy right. shit. And there's so much all conversation right. about, well, it was all, is all the uh, person they're talking about. She had used this in her act before. Uh-huh. She wrote blogs about it. But then there's all this stuff about like, well, what do you own? Is the truth even ownable? If you're talking about it in the public, why am I not allowed to? Uh, then, of course, there's class. Do you really say that stuff about people in front of other people? That's mm-hmm. on stage. But that drama between two people who I both call friends and care about pulled that whole storytelling thing right out of Tree Fort. Wow. Yeah, it was unfortunate. They were very apologetic about it. There was lots of flowers and alcohol consumed to try and mend things over, apparently. But um, yeah, it's just and that's and stand up hasn't. I mean, we've I had a public meltdown before I was more medicated where I shut down the entire Idaho comedians group and kicked everybody (laughs) out and erased it. Just one (laughs) night I was all angry and upset like. It just it's I'm, like, I'm, I could unmake you. I'm bipolar. It's fine. <laughs> I take pills now. <laughs> but that's, pills. It doesn't but take long when you're bipolar li- to reset yeah. your life. A better life through chemistry. <laughs> just does that's not. my motto. <laughs> yeah. Burn everything with fire. <laughs> so it's just and that's I love just me. fire. It's so beautiful. So of course, I mean, the first thing I did is I went to the, I went to the person who was injured and I sent I sent her a message like, look, I'm really you know blah blah blah. I just want to check on you. And then I sent the other one a message saying, I just want to say that I love you. Because honestly, when you're the person making the big mistake that you're going to feel as a mistake later in your life, uh, I just want to be there in her memory as saying like, hey, I, I just love you as a person. Yeah. Because I'm not loving yeah, her yeah. now. I'm loving who she's going to be when she regrets this. And I do <laughs> love her now. But that's how love works. It's fourth dimensional. You can't just love somebody, you know, in the moment. You have to appreciate who they, what, what made them now and who they're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I feel. And but I'm all, deep like that, motherfucker. She had no idea that that would evoke such a reaction obviously not so i don't think it was intended there's no malicious intent i don't think so but one could make the argument that there's could be a subconscious drive to embarrass someone a friend of hers who ended their friendship on a bad note mm-hmm. when she doesn't i mean like i can't say that of course because i'm not there but i only i know just enough psychology to know maybe maybe but that means i'm not judging because that would mean she's coming from a place of pain and that's not where I want to attack right, and then somebody. You, and yeah. then you always end up circling around just feeling bad for the person. Right, which is why I didn't get involved. I just told both of them I cared about them. I'm obviously more supportive to the one, but the cool thing is the person who was perpetrated against had a huge support group that came up and like helped her out. She was very public about that, which is one of the interesting things that comedy teaches people. <laughs> Is you just here's the thing I can air all my dirty laundry I'll talk about all the horrible stuff about myself and it's fine <laughs> doesn't change anything uh-huh. all the people who I can tell you the worst things I've ever done and the people who still care about me will come around and the people that didn't they didn't matter anyway right yeah and like you yeah, get to a point much. I think in your life where you're just like oh yeah who gives a shit and performing gets you there really quick because I've been in and doing stand up for ten years now and only seven percent of my friends 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 in that timeline have ever seen me one time doesn't mean anything <laughs> it could. But I can't let it because yeah. it's ridiculous. It's not right. about them anyway. Totes. Let's let's take our first break. Yeah, and then uh, oh, we'll have so much more to talk about. <laughs> you realize I literally we could just record for twelve and a half hours. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk about my child abuse? <laughs> yes, we yeah, might get there. Formed a lot of my Christian yes. stuff early on. We will, we will delve. <laughs> All right, yes. well, let's, let's do the break first. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Atheist Nomads. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Atheist Nomads. You mentioned uh, you're bipolar. Yeah. And we did an episode a few months back on yeah. mental health issues. Yeah. And oh, yeah. we people got a lot of feedback that. on that. Uh, a lot of people, including people hoping that we'll talk about it more. And I think okay. one point that's important to mention is a huge percentage of the guests that we've had on have some kind of a diagnosable or diagnosed mental health issue. It just usually doesn't come up because... There's so many people out there who are still happy and successful and doing well. Yeah, you hear about those people more often. I think that was before social media. You know, one of the things about the Internet is how often it allows us to connect with people who have bad things in common. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, you could start a Corgi group or you could (laughs) join an Idaho atheist group or start a Boise comedians group like I did once. 
Or you could find somebody who also has a horrible disease, be it mental or physical or something else. And I think that normalizes it in a way where people now are more likely to just admit. Sometimes it's weird because people will throw away like, oh, I have bipolar. Like they don't realize what like a life destroying disease that can actually be. You know, like there's a lot of people who are homeless or who died because Mm -hmm. of being bipolar. Depression is the same, I think, because so many people are diagnosed with it. Which, side effect, I honestly think is because people just aren't... We just haven't evolved to live like we live now. We need to kind of become energy (laughs) beings and get out of our bodies real quick. I could really (laughs) totally ditch this body. (laughs) Because it's just not... So I really feel like... I mean, yeah. There's a lot of stuff. I've been diagnosed with a lot of things in my life. And uh, the first... uh, I don't know what he was. But we moved from Idaho to Washington State for a couple years when my dad Mm -hmm. was actually a... uh, programmer working for king county around seattle and okay. i had anger problems and by the time i was third or fourth grade i was already kicking over my desk and throwing all my books at my teachers and i would when i was fifth and sixth grade when we eventually moved back down here to idaho after my grandfather died uh idaho doesn't care about kids so i didn't see a school therapist <laughs> yeah <they're> like, <laughs> what did not happen what they did just is put they them out in the hallway hmm this is like, just put him out in the hallway. Right, just do it. No, I just, well, in the fifth grade, Mrs. Snedden lied about me. She's dead now. It lied about me. Oh, uh, she was an old lady and I was 12. <laughs> 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 she lied about 11. She lied about me in a teacher, teacher's parent conference and I never oh. forgave her. I made, literally made it my mission for that one crime. Oh. And it could have been at this point as a grown up, she could have misremembered. But yeah. I was, so I mean that's right. fine. You think about all the kids that teachers are right. dealing with, and all it takes is a, a kid to have the same letter in the f- first name, and all of a sudden you're talking about the wrong kid, right? <laughs> and then so they switched me teachers to the other teacher because they felt like a man could handle me. In the sixth grade, they sent me to Miss Atkins' class. I didn't last like two months before they kicked me over to the school teacher, uh, the school gym teacher, because he would make me run laps if I would mouth off. <laughs> <laughs> and it was difficult though because a lot of those problems came out of like the issues and things that were happening at home with my mother and I personally feel like a lot of that stuff is my brain developed in an environment where anger and fights and abuse mostly emotional it became more physical as the kids aged so as the oldest I got threats of physical violence more mm-hmm. than physical violence the younger kids got some act around a lot more than I did just as everyone got older and more angry and whatever but I feel like that it programmed my brain to be in a weird way. And I don't know if it just works incorrectly, but they can medicate me in ways where it's not as bad now. All right. Well, so okay. I just feel that's normal. A lot of people grow up in violent mm-hmm. child, like and horrible, like things you would never want a child to grow up in. And those logically yeah. don't turn out to be healthy human beings. And that disease tends to manifest itself in, uh, obviously I think in some cases in this instance, uh, mental problems. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. And it is unfortunate that schools don't have the therapy and the counseling and all that that these kids need because then they just get shuffled around just like mm-hmm. it sounds like you did. And never you just moved a lot. And so and it was. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you never get taken care of. You just you get to the point where you finally realize as an adult say, oh, wait, we might actually be able to take care of this. <laughs> but. It would have been nice to have gotten that when you were like 15. Mm -hmm. It would have been better, I think, you know, and then my parents kicked me out and I was homeless right when I was 18. So my, I wasn't allowed to own a car or have a job. So I kind of had to build all that when I was moving from floor of my friend's rooms to floor of my friend's room. I got a job at McDonald's. And so I got married less than two years, like less than a year and a half later. Man, I kind of feel you a little bit. I mean, my mom kicked me out when I was 18, but luckily I did have a car and I ended up living in a knit for a few months yeah and just think about how young an 18 year old is yeah you don't know yeah. anything yeah they're so stupid <laughs> and you just expect them to be adults because the law says they could be held accountable i don't think that's right. logical they're adults so we can send them to war oh yeah i'm, Man, I'm against I, that too I, <laughs> don't even... I actually I, I was recently hit by a motorcycle at that time so i had brain damage I, like wow uh, short-term long long-term memory damage at the time still uh, a few other things so yeah it was it was harsh I, it's like well cool. he'll, be, he'll be fine <laughs> i sure. just well i think that's also an older generation of ways of looking at things they just like well it's obviously not completely broken so there's nothing wrong with it true 18 year an 18 year old 50 years ago is way different than an 18 year old now an 18 year old now is an embryo of an adult they well, yeah they we know that 18 year olds can't do 
Anything. Anything. I'm surprised when they can keep their shoes tied. Yeah, but 50 <laughs> years ago, an 18-year-old was expected to have already worked a job. Um, but they were working by Had then, a kid. Though. Had a kid. <laughs> start, get married. Um, yeah, th- there was house. Diff- way different <laughs> expectations of an 18-year-old 50, 60 years ago. Yeah, when your house cost $1,900. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. the car Whatever. was 300 <laughs> Yeah, back in the day when the average house literally cost a year's wages. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just imagine? commented yesterday Instead that we like saw a car 50? that was literally a year's wages. A car. It was a truck. It was like, that's ridiculous. Used at that. The economic landscape has taken on new dimensions. Oh, yeah. And, and just new numbers. Oh, we're just spoiled just millennials. Uh, numbers that don't I'm make sense. Why, technically. <laughs> <laughs> the the numbers right now they just don't make sense everything's upside down they've been like that for a while i saw a, a post today somebody was trying to blame uh clinton first clinton and uh obama's neoliberal policies on disenfranchised youth from social stratification which are policies of course derived from things that reagan initially started in the, in the 80s and carter actually started before him see i mean so it goes even farther and i'm not i'm not saying i agree with any president that we've ever had all the way mm-hmm I do like the last one, or the one we have right now. Uh, he's doing most of the things that I would like him to. He's a moderate Democrat. What did you want from the guy? <laughs> I'm like, I think, you know, I mean, he's... It's far better than when George W. Bush said that what uh, that atheists shouldn't count as U.S. citizens. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, that was a president yeah. of the United States talking about a segment of the population, and we, we that wasn't even a big deal. Right. It was just roll it off the back. You're yeah. like, oh, yeah, yeah that's yeah, how that everybody a, feels. That was like a throwaway comment. Nobody could fucking care. He wasn't even trying to upset anybody. He it, was just like, and a thing I think. Normally, <laughs> my, my ideal setup for, for the politics of the country would be a very liberal House of Representatives, a moderately liberal Senate, a moderate president, and a conservative Supreme Court. That way you yeah. have people pushing for change, and then you also have people who can say, let's slow down just a little bit, but you still have people pushing for change that can actually really drive it. <laughs> I just think we should uh, we should do it all by uh, paint gun battles <laughs> <laughs> in the Senate. Best episodes of Community, by the way. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, my okay. God. <laughs> you know, I, I honestly think that the directions that we call liberal and conservative kind of shift as well as you know we do. I think that culture moves forward at a pace. Mm-hmm. I, I think that we communally work towards making it in the direction we would like it to go. So, like, it's just some large, large amoeba, and we're just on one edge pushing in one way. And that doesn't mean anything in the grand structure, mm-hmm. but it does mean that if enough of us are in the same way, we could push the country. Because right now... Sure. Yeah, uh, the locals definitely help amoeba. push it. Yeah, I think it really is everything. That's why our... A broken democratic system is the way that it is, is we're trying to account for even the smallest voices as yeah. much as we can. I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the uh, caucus on the 22nd for the Democrats. Yep. We'll be there uh, with you. Well. And my goal to fix this has been to get as many of my friends there who want to make a difference, even if they've never been to one, so that we can at least be together. Oh, yeah. yeah it'll be, be a party. Yeah. It'll be caucus soon for Bernie here. And I'm, I'm still 80, 90 closer all the time bernie i just never give up on any qualified candidate for my party because i don't want to jump through mental hoops when i have to drop the one that i love for the one i have to go with and i, I totally agree with you there are some people i know online who's i would rather vote for a republican than hillary no, you wouldn't but no really you wouldn't. i don't you know don't. i don't I don't know anybody that's actually serious about that. They, I don't think they, they are either. It. They yeah, say it. Pick which one. Pick which one. And which? let me talk policies about it. <laughs> Uh, I don't think get me wrong. I'm all for Bernie, problems. but if he's gone, then I'm <laughs> voting for Hillary. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's just the case. I don't think Hillary solves a lot of the problems of things. I think I don't think, but I do feel like the argument that she would go a pace with a lot of the things Obama has tried to do would be pretty similar. I think it would be very similar. Oh, yeah. They hate oh, no, her, totally. too. I, I think that Hillary would be like four or eight more years of the same. Yeah, they would hate her just as much. They would just stop talking racism and start talking something else. Well, the sexism well, thing woman. is definitely uh, been you know the whole vagina bummed. thing, but it won't be like that. Will be that won't be in the language as much, I think, because they get too much blowback from that. But that will be the reason mm-hmm. they don't love her at all, and I understand why. But I, and I get what she's doing too. I I just I think she's more battle worthy in a lot of say, well a lot of ways, and I really think mm-hmm. that because she's just unflappable in a lot of ways. But that doesn't mean I love her. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's uh, take our second break. Okay. And then when we come back, uh, let's talk about your background.
We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. All right, so Mikey, you yeah. had a very interesting uh, religious upbringing. Yeah. So uh, mm. tell us a bit about that. Okay, so my first, my okay, my origin for religion is this. Origin I, I, story. Right. I grew up without it, like for the first few years. My father had fallen away from his faith, which was a very classic Protestant style religion of my grandparents. And uh, he became kind of a, you know, mid-70s low-key hippie. And then oh, yeah. uh, when I was born in 77, he had been married. He had got a business degree at BSU. He uh, had not been, you know, in a faith. And then when I was about four, so here the beginning of the 80s, four or five, my parents dropped me off at uh, his mom and dad's, my grandparents' house, and they went to get baptized in the Boise River. We sure, started off... All uh, right. We started off with basic Protestant type churches. Okay. So it was very classical, a lot of some non-denominational. I was really young and don't know a lot of the details, but very quick, my father's wanderlust, which I inherited, he moved him with church to church. He'd find a reason, some reason they didn't get along, something they taught. My mother was crazy. So that fueled a lot of it. She'd get accepted by these church groups and then they'd find out what kind of human she was and they would just <laughs> ostracize her and then we'd leave. So we started to find ourselves farther and farther away from the center of Christianity in its modern sense. You know, we uh, when we lived up in Washington in the late 80s, <clears throat> we went to Charles Fortune's church, which was a Haitian teaching a <clears throat> form of church in an Indian reservation. And we were the only white family. Oh. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went in, and that's where that started. The church's name is called the Body. The Body teaches a lot of stuff, and my dad has been in and out with those guys mostly ever since. Uh-huh. We flirted with one called the uh, First, what was it something Apostolic Church? They believe that dead people come to uh, church services twice a year. Whoa! So they had services where we would sit, and the dead were supposed to be around us, and the sermon was to them, and we would just sit and listen to that sermon. And then so we was there, there was actually spaces. You, you guys would be like spaced out on the pews. Okay, so, so could small church, a lot of pews, not a lot of people in it. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. Okay. Uh, my family of seven people in a lot of these churches would frequently make up like a quarter to a fifth of the church somewhere. Okay, well, sure. just a lot of kids, okay. and it was a family that, uh, <clears throat> and they were. I don't know if they were affiliated with the body, but they were very close. It was the New Apostolic Church or something like that. And that was in their doctrine that there were two sermons twice a year, once on the anniversary of when God went down to hell and a witness to the, the, the sinners that were in prison and let some of them free. And it's basically supposed to be that every year people in hell get let out of their prisons and they get to come up to go to church and they can be saved there. Which seems to me to be the wow. eerie, or easiest conversion process that's ever. Pretty, that's kind of cute. <laughs> you get well, open it, with it. <laughs> So what's really interesting with that one is the whole Christ going to hell, that's actually coming from the apostolic tradition, not from the Bible. Mm-hmm. So you wouldn't find that in, in a typical Protestant church. Yeah, the, the, the new apostolics were weird, but it was very small. Wow. We eventually fell in with more of the body proper. Uh, when I was 17 or 18, there was a guy who actually rented out a building on Sundays to teach church out of, and that was the body. And they call each other brother. They they uh, go back to the way the way the way was back in Acts, and you can't see the quotation marks, but they're there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, back then, people used to hold church services in their homes, and a lot of the talk and conversations, it would be like people just getting and congregating together, not in a building, but we just get together where we can fit. And then anyone Whoever had the biggest up, living room. Right. <laughs> and their policy, though, and this was interesting, is anybody could get up and speak. Any of the brothers, so any recognized member of the church could speak on any given day. Okay. And on that, though, anybody could come up after him and then say something opposite. Oh. So it was sure. really interesting how they would work it out. Because, for instance, some of the things that my dad teaches, uh, the things found in the Bible, whenever Jesus talks, in, when he speaks and he talks, about the, he talks about the clouds, he's speaking about the church. Whenever he says birds of the air, which happens quite a few times, he's talking about teachers. 
And then you can actually read the verses and replace the words. And it actually creates a lesson that that church would teach. <laughs> and it's really weird how often they would find something that fits this. Now it's all wow. made up like so much of it, but to them it's there. That's what makes it Gnostic. They see the thing, they see the types and shadows as they call it. So once you see that birds are teachers, you can enter the word bird in an online uh, concordance and you can look up every verse. So they would come, my dad would teach church with 30 or 40 verses Oh wow! to support what he was saying because that's what they taught in their church is it had to be like a solid logical argument. So my dad has my brain in the body of a true believer. And that he really <laughs> is good. It puts all this stuff together. So we did my dad's church in his living room for a long time. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's nice. Uh, that's where I got married the first time was in my dad's church. I have pictures. Mm, nice. It's really adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and Actually, so, I would love to see those pictures. <laughs> but it's interesting because you have to then juxtapose that with a lot of the, the, the lifestyle of what we had at home. So my dad would work 40 plus hours a week as a very stressed out computer programmer, giving him all sorts of stomach problems. And migraines. And then my mom would cause all these problems with all the kids at home. And then he'd have to come home with this. The friction to deal with all this stuff between before he got home and after would always be either not always violent, violent, but emotionally and uh, occasionally physically violent. It would create an environment that was really difficult then to switch over to church talk on Sundays. Hmm. It's the same living room that you slap somebody, one of your kids in, you then have to try to teach them later in the week is just weird. And I think that was one of, not the first by means, but a lot of one of the first emotional things that kicked me out of really believing anything, because when that's your church for the last several years of life, I then moved to uh, a regular Protestant church again when I was going to youth group in my 17 and 18. And uh, that's kind of the church that I was in when I got kicked out of it. Boring old people church, but no drama or weird shit. (laughs) So you got uh, yourself kicked out. Well, and not, I mean, kind of, I just stopped caring because <laughs> like me and my other nerd mm-hmm. friends, cause I had Christian nerd friends. Well, you, you grew up with the two facedness of it. Yeah. So you were hard. already kind of like disillusioned. <laughs> it's rough. You know, when I was kicked out, most of my friends were still in the church. That's where they came from. And the, I would stay on their floors, like my buddy's floor. We, they'd be 17, I'd be 18 or whatever. And, and then I'd have to move from week or a couple days to a couple days because I didn't want to overload anybody. And they were cool about that. I thought that was actually very Christian and why I like these social constructs of pro community con- like philosophies is because, you know, I mean, from an objective point of view, it's better that the teenager who was kicked out of his weird house has a place to stay. And if you're passed around the church, it doesn't become a burden for anyone. Yeah. Mm hmm. Until one family stood up and let me stay there for a couple months. I got a job at McDonald's and I got my I got my first place. But by the time I did all that, the thing of it is, is I was such a real believer. Like, you, it's really difficult. I really did have faith. Like, I would hear the voice of God in my head. That's always a good thing to remember. <laughs> and I know that that's just a manifestation of the desire for me to actually hear that was then creating those voices towards the end of it when I was 17, 18 and going to church and I'd hear these voices, I would argue with myself if they were real or not. Because even at that point, I didn't feel like they were genuine. Mm. And because like, but I think that if the person hears the thing because of their desire to hear it and then moves forward is how you get people who have beliefs like that. Like God speaks to me because yeah, your brain is telling you that and you refuse to talk yourself out of it. Because it's obvious God's not talking to you, because then it would be infallible, and it would know stuff that you don't know, and that never, ever happens. Yeah, it's always really... Yeah, it's always stuff you want or you think. Fake stuff or selfish mm-hmm. stuff. And it's... Yeah, so... And that happens a lot, so 17, 18-year-olds, you know, there's hmm. usually a crisis of faith right about that age. I mean, it's normal. You know, and, you, and then you also realize, as an adult, having to make up... Because I, I didn't... I wasn't taught any of these skills. I didn't know anything about being a grown-up at all. And I know we underprepare, but I literally had nothing. My mother's crazy. She has a third-grade education. When you actually see her type, oh. it's... It, I, I actually blacked her out of my life, just for healthy reasons. No reason yeah. to... But, like, yeah, it was really frustrating. I, no, I would have to translate her words for other people. She sounded like she had a learning disability. When she typed, even though she'd been on the internet every day since they invented it, is <laughs> literally why we always had it. Wow. <laughs> so it was interesting when I first moved out, then my relationship with Christ and God kind of, I found more reasons. I got jobs where I had to work on Sunday. I, you know, and then after a while, when I was married the first time, 
uh, my friends were still involved in a lot of ways, but I was kind of like, meh. And that's, but the thing of it is, is that's what my whole life was built around. I wasn't really drawn towards, I was actually trying to go to Bible college at the time. I almost got nice. a full ride scholarship. Was your wife religious? Catholic. Oh, wow. I oh. never date anyone who believes like I do. Wow. Yeah. We got married two days after her 18th birthday. Oh, legit. We were both virgins. That was a really bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First yeah. time's practice. She's got kids, though. I ran into her at Costco once and then hid behind some clothes so she didn't see me. Aww. She had her husband Aww. with her, and I didn't want to be awkward. I didn't know if she knew I existed I remember that time that we were married? That yeah. was so embarrassing. It would be like, whatever. I would much rather have that conversation, if ever, with just her and I at a coffee shop or some yeah. shit. Yeah. Where we could just say hi and shake hands and never talk again. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to make it awkward in front of her kids and show you. Yeah, this is my first husband that you've never heard of before. <laughs> <laughs> like your children. This is a person we don't talk oh. about. It's fine. It was a, we were only married for like two years. We got married. She was gone before she was twenty one. I think mm. we got married right wow. after eighteen. So yeah, we weren't together more than three years. I was definitely a first practice marriage for her. Very good. Got that out of the way for her. Yeah, oh, that's good for good. her. It's good. For- <laughs> yeah, but so- after that, no, I didn't really. I flirted with going to church. I went to that mega church when I was 18 for a little while through this process. Uh, Capital mm-hmm. Christian over on Eagle and Fairview. Oh, big yeah. Big ass one. I went there for a while because the uh, anonymity of being in a crowd. It's it's huge. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's huge for Idaho How standards, huge are we not talking? Texas. A hmm? couple, couple thousand? Uh, I would, you know what? I, I, honestly, it's been since the 90s. They're still there. But there were at least a couple times I've been there, I want to say at least a thousand people. That, I think. They've expanded yeah. too, so yeah. they're bigger now than they were. Driving by it, the, it looks like, I would guess the sanctuary probably seats three or four thousand. Yeah, it's been a long maybe time. Maybe even five. Huh. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. It's Everyone's crazy friendly though. There was a, a charismatic Christian church, so I really enjoyed, uh, the, I was in uh, church choirs for a really long time, and uh they had a really good like Christian rock group and <laughs> the social stuff was fun. I always had a, I always struggled going to the youth group events though, because I always knew more about the Bible than the teenagers did mm-hmm. because I went to the body for so long when they're all about read 50 verses. This yeah. Is what they yeah. Mean. They don't really do that for youth group <laughs> yeah. these days. It's more just, here's a lesson with a verse. Yeah. Don't fuck each yeah. other. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't touch each other. <laughs> Soaking doesn't count. <laughs> God's like, was that one uh, comic? God's like a T Rex. If you don't move, he can't watch you fuck each other. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not even. Which apparently uh, soaking is now an epidemic at the BYU campus. Yeah, you can still get STDs. Yeah, a few years ago it was, uh, it was saddle anal. backing. What it's was that? Just saddle backing. It's saddle backing. Anal. Oh, I just call it anal, like a grown up. That saddle backing is pretty fun. Is, is specifically anal to preserve virginity. <laughs> All right. So the the I'm, more I'm, you I'm know. I'm down with that. Okay. Ding. True yeah. story. Uh, so after my uh, my virgin wife and I got divorced, I was no longer a virgin. I was still kind of Christian. My logic became: you can't have premarital sex if you've already had sex and been married. So I became <laughs> oh, yeah. a total whore. Ah, yeah, yes. So I, my like, third hello, girlfriend, world. my third girlfriend was one of those girls wanting to maintain. She was reclaiming her virginity for oh, marriage. That's oh, that's no. popular Uh-oh. now. So that's we still had sex five times a day. Most of it saddlebacking. She also introduced me. To hot wax so i didn't know how far she was from virginity <laughs> pretty far <laughs> not close <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's that is true and ever since i mean whatever at this point you know i I've love it married, when you but, hear about people in their 30s trying to reclaim their virginity or people in do I, why even talk like that why yeah why because yeah. they want to go to heaven because they want to go to heaven virginity is such a bullshit notion anyways but even if you do believe in that shit, you're not getting it back. Fuck you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Justin Bieber. Uh, uh, it's just so depressing <laughs> that w- how we fuck over our own pleasure as a country and not teaching people about the realities of sex. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, well, I had a uh, Unitarian sex camp available to me. I didn't go. My sister went, though, and she came back home asking about why guys do it in the butt. So they, she obviously got a pretty thorough education for, you know, a 12 year old. Yeah. Which is how it should be. Yeah. Made my dad incredibly uncomfortable. And I think he left the room. <laughs> <Yeah>. But um. <laughs> my niece first asked me about sex when she was eight years old. 
but it was bug sex. And I literally had that moment. Here's the thing. This was like 10 years ago. I was in my 20s when this happened. Younger, maybe. And she was like, uh, she said something along the lines of, why do manises bite the heads off of boy manises while after they're done mating? And I stopped and I looked at her and I was like, I'm just going to be scientifically accurate in this one. Go for it. And not lie. <laughs> you can't. Like, some creatures, when they're during the course of mating, have different ways. It turns out that praying mantises, occasionally they're hungry enough to eat the male because they need the food. Turns out that also mostly only happens during uh, scientific studies. It doesn't happen as much in the wild unless she's super uh, hungry. It only happens like one out of like eight when times. Like they're stressed, probably, yeah, we have one right? out of eight times in the wild, most of the time under observation. So, so, yeah, stress and hunger. Recently, Lauren got to explain to a friend's daughter oh, God. about furries. Furries. Oh, I love that conversation. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. She, um, this girl came up, to, I admit, she is making a, a furry head piece, mm-hmm. and I kind of made a comment, oh, you're doing a really good job, you, your technique is getting really good, but dot, 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 furries. And so she came <laughs> up to me, mm-hmm. and she's like, so what's the deal with, fur- what, what's your... D- Beef with What's furries. The deal with furries? I'm like, ask your mom. And she's like, I already did. She sent me to you. Like, <laughs> a and so I look at her mom I like cross like, am I really gonna have this talk with your daughter? Yeah, yeah, I guess I am. So I explained <laughs> the whole yiffing underworld to her and she's like, uh, No, yeah. no, that's not what well, I've seen at full all. Explanation. Hey, why not? And I I'm like, You're at an age where your community of furry friends are protecting you from that, but give you about another two years, and yeah, you'll see it for what it started out as and what mm-hmm. it continues to be. And um, it, it was really super awkward, and I don't think I will ever forgive that woman for, for making me go through that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's it, it should be an unspoken rule that it's mom's job to explain or help walk her her daughter through her kinks, not mom's friend. You know what? Let's just do a YouTube channel series and explain no, everything objectively that. to people. <laughs> there you go. And then you go, you show this to your kid. How old are you? you know, okay, and then you just be like, furries. And then you just do obs- a three minute obsessed furry. obsessed with dragons? Here we go. Yeah. It's called hey, scales. No, being the cool friend is awesome. I like doing that. I've always been the tattooed, smoking, angry uh, uncle, though. So it's easy for me to have these jobs. I tried to teach my five-year-old niece how to do the shocker. Because yes. uh, her uh, coworkers were giving in the, or coworkers, her co-students were giving her the middle finger, and I wanted her to have a something. Oh, it could one up. up. Yeah, but her f- hands weren't strong enough to maintain it. It's like it's like learning how to do the live long and prosper. Yeah. You kind of have to force your hands into it first, and, and then, then you it. build up the muscle. Oh, yeah. for me playing guitar, it was uh, the chord G. Mm-hmm. I actually had to hold my hand a little bit at first, and then I just held it in position for like forty minutes, and then I was fine. <laughs> Before that, I I couldn't do it, but it's also on a classical guitar with the really wide neck, and I was twelve, and my hands were nowhere near as big as they are now. He's showing off a little there. <laughs> so he's uh, trumping it. All right, let's go ahead and take our our last break. Ooh, and uh, the the last segment. Uh, I'm scared. Why? What are we talking about? I don't know. Okay, Aha! that's fine. We can wing it. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. To make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon, find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please, think of the kittens. The body to me sounded like a crazy person out in the boonies who had this idea of what religion should be and kind of started up it in his house. Probably how it started. There's some facilities out near uh, Portland, actually, where they've got uh, they've got a whole bunch of stuff. We would do body gatherings there. We also went to one in Missoula. And it is. Here's what it is. (laughs) Uh, They start they start with breakfast, which are which is cooked at like five thirty six in the morning and everyone has breakfast. And then they start the teaching and then they go until lunch and then they go until dinner, and then they go until bedtime, and then they do that five days in a row. And so people who mm. are hardcore, like my dad, would take the whole week off, and I'll drag all seven of us up there, and then we literally did nothing but sit in church from when we first got up to when we went to bed. How did you not burn the place wow. down? Uh, this is an age before things he like cell try. phones. I, uh, I once brought a gallon of chocolate milk to see if I could drink all of it, and then so I'd have lots of reasons to go pee. 
<laughs> or throw up. <laughs> yeah, and I made it. I made it. Uh, you know, I don't oh. know a lot of counting tiles in the ceiling. Yeah. I I love the chocolate milk trick, but only because I'm slightly lactose intolerant, so I just <laughs> fart like a motherfucker. I just... It was it was the worst. I remember the one in Missoula being a nightmare because I was older for that one. I must have been like 16. And it was just the older you get for those things where you're sitting. And it's here's the thing. When you go to a charismatic church or a Pentecostal church, the guy in front of a thousand people is entertaining. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He knows how to talk. He knows how to read. He knows how to dress himself. He did his eyebrows. <laughs> like, yeah. But these guys in the body, maybe they are literally from Missoula, Montana or, you know, or McCall or something. And or my dad, where he taught church to his family and some people from Nampa. You know, every Sunday, and it, there wasn't. My dad's a computer programmer. He is not charismatic, mm-hmm. <laughs> and these guys could talk as long as they want. And it was so. It was really. It was disjointed and annoying and difficult. And and then they would argue occasionally, working oh, out nice. <laughs> because sometimes they disagree. Yeah, and then they just it, there's it has to be a consensus formed. So was that the Gnostic group? Yeah, the body. Okay, so bad name. Yeah, are you familiar <laughs> with the like classical Gnostics? Yeah, the original. I, yeah. I'm the one that actually labels them that based on just their okay. the overlapping tendency to find knowledge and faith as opposed to actually... And, and believing that it's... It's it's real. Inborn yeah. and there's this true knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I actually That's have the a, whole the spirit or the spirit will let them hear kind of thing. Uh, on the bookshelf there, I have a copy of the Nagamadi scriptures. Oh, yeah. I, I did a, a seminar in Gnosticism <laughs> in, in it's, seminary. They're an interesting way to think about things. Yeah. Uh, but it's not necessarily that wackier than any other group of Christians I've been to. No, no, it's it realistically, and there is a, a actual like explicitly Gnostic group in California uh, trying to bring back the old Gnosticism. And when you you look at it, all it is is taking dualism to its natural extension. That the body mind separation, the at a certain point they are completely distinct and separate. Yeah, I don't think that's true. No, it's not. <laughs> but it is the, the logical conclusion of that. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. I, I mean, oh, I is that where they got the name? The body. <laughs> the body. I, should go I with don't the mind. know. It probably would have been the body of Christ. Charles Fortune is actually uh, was actually considered a uh, what do you call him? Probably. Anyway, he had an actual elevated title they gave him when they he eventually broke away from the group himself. Charles Fortuné, uh, his actual thing that he was doing, his real calling is he was a real-life Haitian who got an American uh, citizenship and then traveled the country, for the most part, uh, for he had stopped and ran this church for a few years, and then raised the money and then took this money back to Haiti to help the people. Hmm. Now, a majority of that money was used to build churches, but in his head, he's still helping the people. So when I was still around, he had built over 20 churches in the area of Port-au-Prince and areas that he was from. And then he was eventually killed by somebody who shot him in the head while he was in his driveway because Haiti and Port-au-Prince and that yeah. used to happen uh, a lot more often. I'm pretty sure it's not great now. It's not great. Now. <laughs> so, yeah. Do just, you think that was because he was rich or because of his church? He was rich for a Haitian, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, when you talk about the violence at the time, and this was after Baby Doc, like, but it was still, it's like, it's just Haiti. You know, if you got mm-hmm. shot in the head in Haiti, it would just, maybe we'll never know. Especially yeah. since I've probably found out months after it because it would have had to go its way into the church through the body, like all the way and then to my dad who got around to telling me. So, but he was in in my head at the time. He was actually the most Christian out of a lot of people I knew because he acted on faith. He traveled the country. He showed videos of voodoo, of who done down mm-hmm. in actual Haiti to try to rustle up some money. And it was a really good gig, really. I mean, he just he went super Haitian. <laughs> like he was Haitian as fuck, like legit. Yeah, and but here's the thing: he would stop by our house. He was always like an uncle. He was super friendly. We'd kids, we'd climb all over his lap, and he had a bunch of kids of his own with his wife, a nurse named Ruth, who eventually divorced him. She was American. I think that's how he might have gotten his citizenship initially. <laughs> Probably. Oh, wow. so he had a, he had a couple American kids. They were older. Uh, he was like mm-hmm. in his sixties or something. And you know, it's kind of you always kind of think, oh, what a waste for him to go and build a church. But well, any kind of community afterwards. building is a huge bonus in those areas it will just in in my in my translation of his actions is he felt like he was doing the best he could oh, yeah. to be a good person mm-hmm. he my, yeah. he wasn't as good with money so he came to my dad who unlike me is 
And my dad was actually kind of his accountant for his 51C to do all this. They did all, my dad helped him set up all the legal stuff and made it 100% legit. And he, when he was around, he always, to me, seemed like the vision of what a Christian should be. Loving and caring and everything and then trying to do the best. And, and I always liked him, but the rest of the church was crazy to me. Like, whenever I'd sit in the things and people would talk, I was just, it was unnerving. And that was definitely a lot of the unraveling. So even though I gained a lot of insight into way, you know, people view the Bible, I just didn't, it's, it's a, it just kind of got, I kind of got over, I kind of got an overdose too. I've, I've blacked out much of my Bible knowledge. Yeah. It's like, you know, you've known it, but you don't know it anymore. So long. I, the thing of it is, is it's not useful. I'd rather know stuff about, I don't know, Harry Potter, because then I at least have other nerd friends that I can bond with Harry Potter over. Right, you don't have that community where you can go to somebody's house and nerd out over Bibles versus... Right, and when I had my Bible nerd friends, I would do stuff like that. Like, me and my friend Mike Logue, who I believe is still in the faith, uh, he went to Southwest Christian over on uh, on Five Mile Road. He and I would talk, we'd have huge nerdy conversations about how God would have to exist outside the concept of time, and how that would logically explain all of his behavior. We were having these conversations at like 15, 16, 17 years old. Because we were trying to rationalize God in an irrational faith system. Yeah. Mm. And that's and I think his nerdism and my dad's led farther in and then mine led out because I kept struggling over inconsistencies and they never sat well with me. So at what point did you finally call it quits and say, oh, you know, I, I am actually an atheist? Know. Weird. I mean, because, you know, I used to go to church camps occasionally. We were poor, so we always got in to go for free. You know, I went on quote unquote mission trips with certain churches, TVCC, when they were still around. And, you know, and and so a lot of that stuck with me because I had so much investment, Mm -hmm. you know, like all I like up to 10 years of church choir stuff, all the the church plays that I did. I always got a lead role, you know, and so I was always I don't know if it was nostalgic, but I maintained the identity of one past the actions of faith. So when my first wife and I split up, she was the one that suggested I get back into church for happiness because I was really having an existential crisis. Mm. I was young and, you know, and like when you're told your whole life that you get married right after you're 18 and you put your life together and I had a job that was leading to a career, you know, and I had a wife and we had collected some stuff and we had a great, uh, we had a German shepherd. Oh, it was super American, but it didn't feel better. Yeah. And so her solution was the church and I did not go that direction. (laughs) (laughs) I went to see how far the rabbit hole could go. (laughs) So, yeah, we. uh, And here you are. Here we are. So, yeah, at some point it just action led to non-action. I had to go through the guilt phase, you know, which is long for people who leave the church sometimes where like I was I would have anxiety attacks of whether or not I would, you know, be able to stay saved if I relinquished my, you know, grace. But. Uh, it turns out I didn't care once you give it up long enough for me. Uh, I wasn't still attracted to coming back because there's just fences in there and ways to behave. And the amount of things that it offers me is nothing I couldn't replace through different like friendship circles or, you know. Yeah. So I think it was just a natural evolution <laughs> away from it. Not not yeah. an epiphany, but just a series of effect. minor. Yeah. Oh. Being exposed to a lot of different churches made me, gave me, brought me to the point where th- I felt there was a truth, but that it wasn't necessarily defined through any single uh, church's teachings. So not having a single <laughs> church's teachings to define that feeling didn't necessarily invalidate my faith because I'd already gotten so, through stages of like, well, all of that's a bullshit anyway. Right. I have always so, wondered so how you people became, like, do that. So you became spiritual, but not religious. By definition, I would definitely say that. I never identified as much as such. Yeah. But I, I became curious, you know, I started to experience things that would have been mentally within degrees of it. You know, I studied things like astrology a little bit to see how that worked. Obviously, it doesn't. So uh, would you say ex- that you became bi-curious? Uh, no, that actually was a realization <laughs> over a salad. Uh, <laughs> I was working at uh, this. Was, was it a, tossed? <laughs> uh, no, this is right after having. two. Okay, so this is actually connected. Uh, I don't know a lot of answers on sexuality. My personal feeling is that my path to that for myself, not that I never wasn't, but that uh, I was already going through this existential crisis and looking for answers. And if the core belief of how you view the universe is not right, then that necessarily leads me to think that not everything could be correct, which apparently this whole straight paradigm thing. And all that happened is I was waiting tables because I quit right after my divorce. I quit uh, Office Max where I was shipping and receiving guy. I got a job waiting tables. At, I started smoking cigarette. I was working at the Olive Garden. <laughs> and I started sleeping around with a lot of random waitresses and stuff. 
And uh, I was there was a really hot bustler there named Tyson. He was a Virgo and had really bright blue eyes. <laughs> and he was a skater boy and he was shaved head. And I know exactly what he looks like. <laughs> and we were both getting salad out of the back. And we had that electrical jolt of eye contact. And yeah. because I was throwing away old ways of thinking, I didn't dismiss it or ignore it. I allowed that to sit in my head and then question it openly to myself okay and that led me to realizations nothing happened with this guy and i we always i fucked each other at work but, <laughs> but yeah so i went from in, it's in almost the, more fun that way and the definition of bisexual no, now is the attraction to two or more basically genders so in this state i and i fell into that identification fairly early i would probably to be most intellectually honest i would qualify being pansexual in that but if we simplify mm-hmm. it, trans partners are men and women, so I classify them as men and women. It yeah. doesn't mean mm-hmm. anything. So to me, it doesn't matter. I, I'm i attracted to who I'm attracted to. I'm cool. mostly uh, heteroromantic, as in uh, 99% of my partners are always women, but I just get along with women better. All right. All right. Um, I think that's a good place to officially end. Right. Uh, we will continue <laughs> uh, patron only. Yeah. Um, but, oh, Mikey, yeah. what yeah. do you have to plug? Uh, you know, here's the deal. I don't have a lot of dates, dates for anything. I am headlining in Olympia. I've got, ooh, I'm doing a week at the comedy club Liquid Laughs in Boise, Idaho, April 14th through 18th, 2016. I'm, uh, <laughs> I don't I'd hope it would be this upcoming April. Upcoming. Could be the last one. Could be the next one. Uh, and then that's, that's all that I know for sure right now. Okay. Right. And then we have our atheist show in June, but you know, I'll do the usual thing when I'm closer to that. All right. And you have a, a- sweet. Facebook, Podcast, Twitter, somewhat. Uh, <laughs> Latter Day Atheist is defunct, but go listen to all of our old episodes. There's some fun conversations and good stuff in there. Yeah, uh, we'll get the ones out with these guys maybe someday. I seriously <laughs> actually want to totally redo that one. Sure, <laughs> do too. It was about um, robots. Uh, robot I talk sex. about robot, robot rights sex. a lot, and yes. it was I like. Once I get realized what we were actually talking about, I'm like, no, no, no. Can we start this over, even mm-hmm. though we're three hours in? I'm a robots right activist. And yeah, we talked about are. that quite a bit. All right. That will be a good starting <laughs> point for the uh, the the patron-only uh, after show. So oh, yeah. I will go ahead and play the outro, although mm-hmm. none of us will actually I, hear it. Oh. I want to talk about robot sex. I want to talk about Blade Runner. <laughs> oh, my God. Would you totally do the female android at the end? Fuck Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. I like all your guys' production value. It looks really and sounds really good. Thanks. He's has, oh, cares. This is, You'll have yeah. to look at This is his wife. I'm the I'm the mistress. <laughs> <laughs> There's enough love for everybody, right?